much, and uh, welcome everyone. I'm really happy to be here, part of the WinOps conference again. And I'm, I'm really excited to have a chance to talk a little bit about site reliability engineering today. And, you know, so we're gonna, helps if I turn this on. All right, so we're gonna say, we're gonna start out talking a little bit about what is SRE, what is site reliability engineering, and so we're gonna do a little SRE 101. And as part of this, we're gonna define, we're gonna drop down a definition of SRE, and um, then we're going to explore what some other people have said about SRE and how some organizations implement SRE, or, uh, SRE as part of their operations practice. So different people have some different ideas about it, and we're gonna start with, we're gonna start with a, with a pretty standard definition. Site reliability engineering is, one, one of the things we're gonna see about site reliability engineering is that unlike DevOps, there tends to be a lot more spe specificity around what site reliability engineering is and what the practices uh, that it entails are versus DevOps, which tends to be a bit broader scoped, right? Um, all right, let's get into it. Site reliability engineering is an engineering discipline devoted to helping an organization achieve the appropriate level of reliability in their systems, services, and products. Now, to me, there's three key words in this definition. Anybody have an idea of what they may be? Just shout them out. System services products, uh, what else? Engineering discipline. Appropriate and reliable, a great, we've got some great guesses out there. So for me, the three key words are engineering, appropriate, and reliability. And we're gonna dive into kind of how those actually apply through, the, uh, through this talk. So it's an engineering discipline. We ensure the appropriate level of reliability, and appropriate's important, because guess what, 100% reliable is not always our end goal, right? 100% reliable is m more often more expensive and, and much more complex to get to for an experience that most users will never see. They won't see 100% reliable because their connection to your service isn't 100% reliable. Now, that said, if you're working on something like medical devices and like if you, you know, the firmware that runs the pacemaker that's, that's in somebody, then maybe 100% reliable is what we're shooting for, and so please continue down that path. <laughs> and then reliable. Now, when we talk about reliability, it brings to mind this. Ideas. Anyone see something like this before? And those of you who were at the PowerShell user group last night should not jump in. How about this? or this. Reliability, in the context of site reliability engineering, is more than reliability of our infrastructure. It's reliability of the services that that infrastructure helps deliver. So when we talk about site reliability engineering, we are not just talking about, have my servers been up? What's the uptime on my servers been? Are, are, um, are we, are we constantly able to, is the web server constantly able to serve requests? It's also, are the services delivering value to our customers at the end? So the first error, we'll just drop it back here, in case you were curious, it's not just a, not just an empty white screen, this is what a PHP app would look like if it aired out. So, all right. Now, SRE kind of comes from the same problem space that we see in, uh, when we have the DevOps conversation, right? We have developers who want to ship features, and we have the ops folks who want to keep things up and running because developers get incentivized to deliver new capabilities, operations people get fired if they break. And this is really, this is really this SRE and DevOps evolved pretty much in parallel. It's not a scenario where, you know, we've got this progression of, well, first I click on things, then I start to automate, now I'm moving into becoming a DevOps, and then 
I evolved into, into the site reliability engineer. That is not the case, right? Site reliability and DevOps have a lot of shared concepts and they, they evolved around the same time to solve a similar problem space. So um, there, you'll find lots of overlap, but you'll also find some differences in how, in how they were implemented, how they're talked about. Um, we started talking about DevOps like 10, 10-ish years ago. And site reliability engineering has only more recently kind of come into the public eye. It started back, uh, it started back around uh, an event that started SRECon back in 2014. And at that event, the person who kind of labeled site reliability engineering, uh, Ben Trainer at Google, uh, he gave a talk where he defined what SRE is, what makes an SRE SRE. And I can't give his talk and sum it up uh, very nice, sum it up as easily, but one of my colleagues did a great thing and bullet listed it for me and kind of summed up some of his key points. And we're gonna work our way through some chunks of this. Now, starting off with that first one might look a little problematic, especially if you're coming from an operations background. However, who here has never written a script of any sort, even one line of PowerShell? So everyone here has written at least one line of shell script or PowerShell or batch or VB script. All right. When you write down something in a language like PowerShell or bash or batch, right, you are writing something that's going to instruct a computer to go do something. That is code. That is by definition code, so you are a developer whether you like it or not. Sorry if that hurts, but you'll get over it. So don't worry too much about that first point. Um, the, the real genesis of that though is we wanna bring some of the software engineering mindset into how we tackle the problems in the operational space. So let's focus first on one of the things I think is, is most important in defining you know, site reliability engineering for your organization. And that is, wow, the blue doesn't show up very well here. Um, all right, the, the first is have an SLA for your service. We can't start talking about reliability unless we actually have a target of reliability to go hit, right? Saying, I think it's slow, or I think it's failed a lot, is not, is not, a, way to have this, is not a way to have this discussion, right? We can argue feelings all day long, and we can all be right about them. But it doesn't, it doesn't do us any good to just have an SLA. We also need to measure and report against that SLA. And that means we have to have specific technical measures that we, can, that we can take to evaluate whether or not we're meeting our SLA. And then the use, use error budgets. We'll talk a little bit about error budgets and gate launches and releases and stuff like that on those. But basically, short version, if things are breaking a lot, don't start introducing a bunch of new features. Focus on reliability first. Get the thing stable and then start moving things forward. So in order to do that, in order to focus in that particular space, in order to focus on the service level agreement, we need to come to those technical agreements and we call those service level objectives. And we monitor those service level objectives and then we can decide, are things good or are they bad? And in order, we, and we need to work together as operations, as development, as business, as, the partner, as our partners in the business for whom rely on the service that we're providing and decide together what those categories are. What are those qualities that mean the service is running well or the service is not running well? So 
So say, for example, we have a service. And we want to shoot for 80% uptime. If we're at 90%, decisions are really easy, right? We're in that green zone. We can deploy new features for, uh, rapidly. We can, uh, we can try new things with our infrastructure. We can maybe introduce new load balancing algorithms and things like that because we're already doing better than what we agreed we'd be doing. So if things, if things don't work out perfectly and we can remediate quickly, it's easy to try th new things out. But if we're at 70% reliability and we want to be at 80, maybe now we have to set the stage for, hey, there's this really important feature that needs to get shipped. I know things have been unstable, but we can have a real conversation about the business value of shipping this new thing versus focusing on restoring stability or waiting a little while until we see the, the improvement in stability in the environment. This is the core idea behind error budgets. It's to enable us to have some kind of defaults in our behaviors, but then when business needs require it, we can actually have a good conversation around it because we have visibility. It's not just, I feel the environment is very brittle, or I think we've went down a lot, right? We can say we've been up for a certain period of time, or responses have been consistently performing within the right latency. This sets us up to create virtuous and reinforcing feedback loops. And this is one of the messages that ties back very well with the DevOps message. So if you've read the Phoenix Project, you may, have, uh, re you may recall the idea of the three ways. The first way is systems thinking, our left to right flow, so you take a business idea, you ship a feature. The second way is creating feedback loops, and that's how do we instrument our environments and applications so that we understand what users are doing, how the application's behaving. And so as we create our service level objectives and service level agreements and, and the service level indicators, SLIs, which are the measures that we have, how do we, uh, how do we use those to bring information back? Well, we have to not just have it for our operations team, we have to bring and publish that information back out to our business stakeholders, to the development teams, right? So that everybody can see where things sit and where they are, and they can use that shared information in decision making. And the more quickly we can get that information back, the more responsive we can be to it. So I apologize, the last ones are, uh, the next points that we wanna talk about here are kind of to the bottom. So I'll read them out to you. We want to have a post-mortem or learning review for every event. Now, every event doesn't mean every time, you know, uh, it, every time something happens. It's every time there's a significant event, right? And that we want to focus on the, the post-mortem being blameless and pointing at the process that we want undergone and the technology that we use. We want to kind of ensure that when we look at what went wrong, it's not this person turned out a switch in the data center and, and, that, and that shut down a rack and then there was a cascading failure. It's not the person's fault, it's why was the system set up in such a way that one switch could knock out half our data center? Why was our system set up in such a way that we couldn't fail over without, without uh, an undue amount of data loss? Why was our system set up such that I could run a command with no confirmation and delete our services in a particular region? These are not people problems, these are process and technology problems. And as we're site reliability engineering, uh, as, we, as we embark in site reliability engineering, we want to engineer those failure points out of our systems and put controls around those things. So observation number two of kind of site reliability engineering is we can't fire our way to reliable because it's not people who are the problem here. Now, there are going to be scenarios where, where it, we do need to let people go or, or whatever there, but it is not 
I mean, if there's malicious acts or something like that. But for accidents or for things that should not be allowed or should not be possible to go and do, right? Firing somebody is not the right, right, right direction. And it also does not create a great work environment. I don't know about y'all, but I've worked in environments where when there's an outage, everybody's on the conference bridge, and there's VPs stalking the halls, looking for the person to fire because it was your fault, or it's your fault, right? Who, who changed things last, right? Why didn't you test your changes? Doesn't matter that we don't have a test environment that re resembles anything like production. That's your problem, not mine. Why are you making it my problem? That does not make for a fun environment. And then when something does go wrong, everybody spends time trying to obscure the things that they did so that it could be somebody else's fault. It's like a big game of hot potato. Everyone's tossing the thing to the person next to them. And that does not lead to an environment in which we can build reliable systems. And People build systems. So because people build systems and we don't want them to be scared about losing their jobs, and we, so we want accurate information from them, we also want to make sure that we're not overloading them with work. So some of the, some of the concepts around site reliability engineering, we want to focus on limiting the amount of reactive work that they do and focus on a significant amount of project work that will make our environments more reliable over time. So in the case of Google, uh, they had a general idea of that we were gonna cap reactive work at 50% and anything else for a particular service would overflow to the dev team responsible for that service. Now, that doesn't mean go back to your organization and say, guess what, I'm only gonna respond to 50% of the tickets or trouble issues and devs can handle the rest. That's probably not gonna go well for you, right? But what this does is, is it starts a conversation around what is the appropriate level of reactive work? Because if you do not have some level of cap there, you will never have capacity for the project work to build reliable environments. They also say share some, at least some of the ops work with the development team. And this is very similar to strapping pagers to the developers. When, when there is some shared incentive and shared pain, it becomes, it becomes a lot easier to justify spending time on some of those management or operations features or instrumenting the app in a particular way to aid in troubleshooting. When you have some shared pain and experience, it really improves how we work well together. They also, you know, have put some numbers around on-call teams. Like the, uh, you want to have a, at least eight people, and you know, for a certain type of rotation. But the general idea is, we don't want to burn people out in on-call. On-call is stressful, right? You can't do all of the things that you wanted to do while you're on-call because, guess what? If something goes wrong, you have to get to your computer and have a reliable internet connection. And you wanted to shoot for a maximum of two events per on, -call, per on call shift. Back when I started in IT, I would have I I would have sold family members to have on call shifts with only two incidents. And especially since I was the sole uh, sole IT guy at a police department, I got all the on calls. So my on call shift was three years, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, Maximum of two events per on-call shift. Uh, it's, a really, uh, it's a really ambitious goal, um, but more than the number, we wanna look at improving the state of that system. We don't want to be responding to on-call events all the time. And you know, this comes back to people building systems. People build systems, so if we, if we have them scared that they're gonna lose their jobs, if we burn them out on on-call, we burn them out on ticket work, right? There is no capacity left to invest in building reliable systems. 
you, we're not operating at our best, our, we're not thinking of the most creative solutions, or we are not able to sit and, um, and, and architect out the right systems if we're all burned out. So, with that, congratulations. You have now passed your Site Reliability Engineering 101, and we are now ready to explore a few organizational implementations of Site Reliability Engineering. I'm gonna highlight a couple. In the session after me, Marcelo is gonna talk about a very specific uh, uh, company's use case, and, um, and, and so I think between that, you'll get some different context because Site Reliability Engineering is not is not, a, uh, is not something that is done in a one-size-fits-all way. We're gonna start with Google's model. And we start there because they're the ones that kind of publicize this way of working. It was the Site Reliability Engineering book uh, that came out on O'Reilly. It was uh, some of the speaking at SRECon that really started to kind of create this foundational model and a number of engineers from Google went out to work at other companies and founded uh, and, and helped bring along some similar efforts. But in Google's model, there's a centralized ladder and they have partner teams for various services to cover geographically. If you are a product team at Google, you have to fight to get SREs assigned. You have to show a certain level of maturity in your service to have site reliability engineers assigned to your service. And when you have a t and your team has to be big enough to support non-call rotation. They're a scarce resource, right? And I just said we must be mature enough, blah, 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 and specific team sizes. So I talked through all my points before I showed them to you. Now, Google is, isn't the only way and the, isn't the only organization that's doing site reliability engineering. We also have a non-exhaustive list of other companies that do some site reliability engineering stuff. And like I said, this is a non-exhaustive list. This is just some names that you may recognize. And it's not exactly current or completely up to date. It's just a list. And we're gonna start with one of those organizations. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how Facebook approaches site reliability engineering. So Facebook has production engineers. And they came to SRECon in 2015 to kind of talk about what production engineering at Facebook is like. And so Pedro is the gentleman who, who runs product, uh, uh, Product, production engineering at Facebook, or at least did at the time of uh, at the time of this talk, and so he he had this he had the second keynote for uh, SRECon, and from that we learned that production engineers at Facebook are hybrid software and systems engineers that ensure Facebook services run smoothly and have the capacity for future growth. They're embedded in every one of Facebook's product and infrastructure teams and our core participants in every single significant engineering effort underway at the company. Now this is a little different than Google's model. In, his, in this definition here, we've got, if I find it on the slide, embedded. So Google's site reliability engineering teams are separate teams where Facebook is embedding these production engineers into product teams. And they make sure to call out that in every significant effort, there is representation from production engineering. The leads at Facebook report, for ops and engineering, report up to the same person. They are not separate hierarchies overall, right? And this is crucial when it comes time to make decisions, right? It, we don't have to go up and have my VP fighting your VP 
on a particular problem. It doesn't have to escalate to the C-suite to come to a decision or a resolution. Now, Facebook's production engineers is you know, about a one to 10 ratio. For, so every, for, for every 10 software developers, there's a production engineer, roughly. They spend 18, 24, or 36 months with a, with a team before they rotate. Now, they are not like a SWAT team that comes in to solve all of the problems and rappel, through, rappel down the side of the building, swing in, type on the keyboard real fast, and then go shooting out the door. And they're not, they don't come in to do a bunch of ticket work and then leave uh, so that the, that the software developers can go do some real work, right? That, that's not the scenario that we have. They are active participants and work on significant projects in building the reliable services. They also have a boot camp, so Facebook's famous for their, uh, uh, for the boot camp that they put all their employees through and all our developers through. There is a variant for that for production engineering. And as I mentioned, leads report up to the same person, and that's a pretty significant thing, right? In order to be effective at implementing site reliability engineering, you do require high levels of management support. This is because of Things like when we want implement error budgets, right? And we need to put the brakes on delivering software. You don't want to have to be fighting about this. You want to have management support for saying, yes, this is the behaviors that we want. Now, what the exact, what the exact uh, breaking points are for each of the services, that you all have to figure out uh, with, on a technical basis and a value basis. But for supporting the overall patterns, or for being able to push back on some of the some of that operational work that's not be that's not project work, right? You need management support for that kind of cap to be able to do that kind of stuff. All right, our next company, Spotify. So Spotify is an interesting one. So. Uh, one of my coworkers, David Blank, he likes to, he likes to uh, refer to Spotify as the place where Agile ran, runs amok, right? They have this weird, uh, and I say weird to me, um, for them it probably makes very much sense, but they have this really decentralized uh, you know, type of team. They call it squads and tribes and fun stuff like that. And what they do is they have ops people in squads. Right, so this is another one that does the embedded model. And though there is a separate tribe called IO, uh, which is more of an infrastructure team, all of the different services have ops people in them. Right? And there is no central SRE team, though they do have working groups or like virtual teams or whatever you want to call them, but basically they get together outside of their traditional management chain. And like I said, they call it ops and squads. Now, an interesting thing that they do is the teams, because there's no like central SRE team or uh, central delivery team, there's a, there's a lot of variability in how services can be delivered and infrastructure managed. And there's no requirement that they follow a particular path. But they do offer this thing called the golden path. And that's a proven way to take software and get it running in production. And it's up to product teams or tribes to figure out if that's the path they want to take or if, if they need to do something else to get their software into production, if something else is going to work better or be more effective for them. So with, the, with these couple of examples here, we can see that there's really no one way to build an SRE team. But if we fall back to those original principles where we're pushing back on you know, that manual interruptive work, where we're sharing some ops work with the development team, where we're defining service level objectives and indicators to support our service level agreements, 
so that we we put some uh, we put some numbers and metrics around what does running well look like. Then we can whether we whether we have embedded teams, whether we have separate SRE organizations. For example, at Microsoft, SRE is a separate organ is separate organizations, and how SRE is implemented at Microsoft varies greatly. A Azure SRE versus SREs and Xbox versus LinkedIn versus uh, now GitHub. Right? There's there's a lot of different ways that SRE happens, but there are some wrong ways. Right? If you just rebrand your typical your traditional ops environment and say, "Oh, your SREs now." and don't change anything, you haven't, you haven't done it. It's the same thing as, oh, guess what, you're a DevOps engineer now, right? If we don't change the way that we go about doing the work, and we just change the title, it's not gonna help us any. So how can we get started? There's a couple of good resources out there. There's a trio of books. The Site Reliability Engineering book is kind of the first one that, ca that came out, and really it's what does SRE mean at Google, and how did they implement the, the ideas? They drill down into some of the practices and practical ways in the workbook, and then my colleague, David Blank Edelman, uh, kind of curated a, a series of stories about how SRE happens in a lot of other places in the last book, Seeking SRE, that gives you some viewpoints on site reliability engineering concepts outside of just Google. There's also a series of conferences. And there's more, right? There's the SRE cons, but you also get SRE content at a bunch of DevOps days. There's SRE content at events like Usenix Lisa, PowerShell Summit, Microsoft Ignite, uh, the Ignite Regional Tour, which is going to be happening uh, starting soon. And many, many other events. You can find it at user groups and all sorts of fun stuff. So, where do you start? Well, at some point you're going to have this problem in your environment. Or you're going to read a book and something's just going to click. Or you're gonna spend some time with a friend who's doing some site reliability engineering, or you go to a meetup, right? Something just clicks. And they, this makes sense for our organization. I would like to work, or I would like to work in this kind of environment. Right. What does not work is you go put a bunch of metrics in place and say, okay, because we've crossed these thresholds, I'm not gonna deal with any more releases. Right? That is not gonna help you at all, right? First, we have to get some management support lined up. Then we need to step in and you know do some research, whether it's read the books, whether it's it's explore and hang out with other site reliability engineers, right? But a great place to start is really kind of dipping our toe into that service level objectives and service level indicators, and exploring the idea of error budget. So before we even get to saying, okay, we're gonna gate releases or we're gonna start pushing work back on, on the product team, we start, get, we start defining some service level objectives, we start capturing some metrics, and then we, pub we publish those, we share those, we take them to management, we take them to our sales folks, we take them to the developers, and we say, do these goals match up with the ideas that we are trying, or, or with what your expectations of our service are. Because now we have a starting place for this conversation. Rather than saying, hey, what does good look like to you? And I, I, who here has ever had to work with an SLA? Who here has defined that SLA? Yeah, very few, right? It, so most of us have had to deal with service level agreements. Very few of us have actually been uh, have actually been uh, required to um, to do to actually implement those things. So now we have a chance to start helping define what those SLAs actually mean. We we can help with the indicators. We can help with the objectives, 
and put meaningful things around that. And I apologize, I'm gonna try to speed up just a second because the charging doesn't seem to be working and it's about to run out of battery. Reliability is not happening here in this presentation, but then I'll be happy to answer any questions. So, read the books, hang out, right? So this is another route you can go. You start out with that reading the books and hanging out with people. The key here is after you have that epiphany, refocus, keep reading and learning because your first ideas may not necessarily be your next ideas after you have some more context, right? So I mentioned Microsoft Ignite and uh, get your phones ready if you wanna take pictures of links. Otherwise, we'll, I will publish the deck as well. Um, but uh, we had a number, we had a little a mini track at Ignite for uh, uh, obsessions around site reliability engineering topics. And I've got a nice handy short link that will take you to the recordings and the slide decks from those. We also have a, a thing called Microsoft Learn. It's our new online learning platform, and we have an SRE course, and we will have more courses coming in in the near future. So uh, there's a little introduction course there now, and like I said, we're, we're, we're working on more content for Microsoft Learn around site reliability engineering. With that, I'm Steve, and let's open the floor for any questions, and at some point, my, my laptop may just shut down. Oh. <laughs> all right, questions. Or have I, have, I all, have I effectively convinced you all to start exploring site reliability engineering as a potential path to take? I'll take that as I did. We have a few moments if anyone wants, oh, here we go. Uh, wait, we have a mic for you. Um, Obviously, lots of big, well-known companies in there. What if you're a smallish company with a relatively small team, say five or six developers? Any anything? How you, anything you kind of say in terms of how to approach site reliability in that in sort of backdrop? So uh, yes, it's a, regardless of your org size, you can do site reliability engineering. Now, what that looks like starts to t starts to take a little different turn, right? Because now your team size is going to be a little different for on call. And you're probably gonna spread some of that on call then into the development team in order to get enough people to make it for a reasonable on call window, right? So who's doing what work where is less important than how we kind of structure the framework around the work, right? And if you're a small organization, metrics are still gonna matter. You know, your service level indicators and objectives are still a good pattern for how we define the metrics that we care about. It's not that we've taken and we've implemented a monitoring tool and we've turned on the default profiles, right? And, and then we have to figure out in context what does 80% CPU utilization with a disk queue length of five mean, right? Does that, or does that even mean anything? I'm getting alerts, but the application seems fine, right? So regardless of your organization size, having the discussions around what does running well mean what, do, what are our targets for how our service should behave, right? And, and it really is a reframing of not just, I don't just care about reliable infrastructure, I care about reliable services. And the infrastructure is a core component in how we deliver that service. So, you know, some of the, some of the patterns and practices may change, or, uh, but the ideas and the things behind them are still gonna be, are still gonna be valuable. And some of the patterns will, or some of the practices will still work well, even if you only have a couple people doing SRE type work, you can still work in an SRE environment. Other questions? Yes. Wait, um, one sec. Got the mic coming on over. So I'm guessing you've probably heard our talk. Um, we're trying to drive what we call platform engineering or DevOps people into the teams to get the teams better at DevOps. From the talk, it sounds very similar to 
the embedded model of SRE in the teams. Could, from what we were describing, is it different? I can't quite work out in my head if it is or not. Yep. So, uh, good question. So, uh, uh, let, let me just restate to make sure that I got it right. So, you're doing, you're, you're, you're embarked on a DevOps journey. You have uh, people doing DevOpsy things in pr embedded in product teams, and it sounds very similar to what we've been talking about with site reliability engineering. And that is absolutely the case. Uh, the, uh, again, the, the, the two efforts kind of happened around the same period of time over the last you know, 10, 15 years as we started to deal with uh, the tension between trying to go quickly and trying to keep things reliable. And, uh, and a lot of the concepts in site reliability engineering map very well to ideas in the DevOps space. What I've, what I've found personally is that site reliability engineering uh, concepts are a little more concrete in, and a little more opinionated in how they're implemented, where DevOps is a little more kind of loosey-goosey, right? Um, there's a lot of different ways to DevOps, and we can all DevOps together, but what works for your organization may not work for my organization, and, um, and there's a broader focus, I think, in DevOps in, you can you know, easily encompass like release engineering type roles and, software, and, and more of the software development role in, the, in terms of shipping, pro, uh, the shipping the service. Where in site reliability engineering, it's a, it's a more tightly scoped conversation where we're really looking at the reliability, uh, focus on the reliability aspect of the service. So, so complementary, a lot of overlap. Um, it's just site reliability engineering tends to be a much more focused conversation. All right, other questions? Otherwise, I will be around all day, and uh, I have another talk yet this afternoon, but we should all hang around from our cellos, because this will be good. <laughs> <laughs>